Yes, I mean, we are focused uh, broadly, but also thinking about if, if we've um, focused on a particular industry, where is the illicit financial flow going? If you're looking at large banking institutions, and there's a heightened focus on those, for instance, is illicit activity migrating to smaller banking institutions, for example? Now, we work with um, our government partners, both state and federal, also our criminal counterparts. And so at any one time, you know, we're not looking at one entity within an industry. We may be looking at hundreds of institutions within FinCEN, writ large in the broad portfolio of responsibilities we have within my division, the enforcement division. So it doesn't really start with one institution. It's more industry by industry. I would say the MSB industry is one which is very much involved. They have, because there's no actual national regulator for that, they're really regulated <laughs> state by state. Mm -hmm. FinCEN serves as that national regulator for them. And even though they're not in there day to day like a banking regulator, I think that's where we see it a lot. The casinos, this was a very big issue. And then most recently in the uh, geographic targeting order relating to real estate, that has, I think, caused lots of excitement in the industry, and I think that you know banks deal with real estate entities as well, and so I think that everything that FinCEN does, the banks react to, because these are usually their clients in some way, but then the client itself needs to sort of get things going. So I think that the latest one in the real estate industry has really been the most provocative of recent time. Ed, I want to key off of something that Ellen said, which is the, uh, the idea of the MSBs, is that MSBs, for those of you who don't know, money service businesses, check cashers, uh, money exchangers, money transmitters, <clears throat> excuse me, they're regulated at the state level, so you end up with someone like Western Union, which is in every state, or a, an agent of an MSB, like Walmart, that's in every state. So they're constantly regulated by all these different entities. Each state has different standards. And I would say that, that one thing that is of, of concern is as we as money transmission, and, and we as a country send out about $55 billion a year in money transmission out of the country, is that we need a better way to regulate it at a national level. The costs of this at the state level and the, the footfalls that get created by complying with state A and not state B are tremendously expensive to the, the folks in the game. What we focus on, because it's what we've heard from FinCEN and from the SEC and now the FINRA letter this year, is a culture of compliance for our clients. Is that what we're seeing is, is, a, with, is a focus at, on the compliance officers and the compliance officers saying, we can't do this alone. We are part of a company that has other people who act without our knowledge. FinCEN and other folks are responding to this by saying, Okay, we hear you. This needs to be a culture of compliance across your industry and across your company. And I think we're going to see more enforcement actions focused in that area going forward. And I'd love to hear you talk about it. <laughs> Is that okay? Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> please, please take over my role. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just getting over one of the bad flus going through DC. Um, you know, certainly uh, FinCEN has uh, enforcement authority against financial institutions and individuals at institutions. We have, uh, over the last several years, taken some enforcement actions involving individuals. You know, what I can say uh, is that we follow our statute. It's willful conduct. Um, we do um, look at all the facts and circumstances involving uh, deficiencies um, by institutions and individuals. And you know, I think um, one of the things that we have done as an agency historically and have continued is to really devote a lot of time to including uh, the factual violations, the factual circumstances, and the legal violations that make up our enforcement actions. Some of our actions can run 40 and 50 pages. And you know, we hope that indicates to industry why we're taking a particular enforcement action and that there's no hide the ball or gotcha. It's very clear why we've taken the action that we have. Yeah, so uh, we did in 2014 uh, make the decision as an agency to issue an advisory um, involving um, what we saw as enforcement breakdowns and a culture of compliance. We really looked across a range of enforcement actions and other feedback we get from industry 
and thought that it made sense to put it in one document. And I think that advisory really goes through some of the areas where we've seen breakdowns in a culture of compliance. Um, we've gotten uh, feedback from a range of uh, industry partners that that advisory has been very helpful. Um, it really was written, um, perhaps not for the compliance professionals, but for compliance professionals to be able to take it to their boards, to their business management, and have a standalone document. It's a couple pages. It's written that anyone can understand it to uh, focus on those issues of cultural compliance. I actually use it exactly that way, mm -hmm. and I think when I when it came out, I was like, well, this is nothing particularly new in the document. However, just the issuing of that document gave, you know, sort of gives the organizations a uh, sort of refresh on how to look at this and how to take a look at this. So I have actually done several board presentations using that as sort of the keying off and having and creating a discussion around what the culture of compliance should be. So I think I used it exactly the way FinCEN had sort of wanted it to be used, and it's been very effective. And I think that, the, that it does cause a lot of conversation. So your clients have a pretty good idea about, you think, what, what represents a culture of compliance? I think that, they un, that they're, they're engaged in the discussion. Uh -huh. Some understand it better than others, obviously, but I think that that conversation, the cost, the reporting lines, you know, we have the, the conversations go pretty broad about who should a compliance officer report to? How, what if they're, you know, how do they deal with things? What is the role of the front line? That's usually a very big discussion at the board level is, What's, what is the frontline responsibility, which is the number one responsibility? You know, compliance, the compliance officers, they, you could have the best program in the world, the best people in the world in compliance, but if that front line doesn't take compliance seriously, then it won't matter. And that's what that conversation sort of creates um, as a result of the, uh, that culture of compliance document. I, I'll just kind of take a little issue with what Ellen said, because I agree that it's the frontline person. As the saying goes, it all depends on the village watchman, and he puts down what he damn well pleases. But the fact of the matter is, what we see is if the board and senior management doesn't make this a priority in AML, in anti-corruption, and in uh, economic sanctions, which are kind of three statutes that kind of fit together in our world, then it isn't going to work at the front line. You can have great people at the front line, but if they aren't getting the support up the line, then it just doesn't happen. And I would say that to what Stephanie was saying, we use it the same way Ellen does. We take this document to senior management. But it was interesting that your document came out when? In 2014? Right. And it wasn't until January of 2016 that FINRA says, this is the year of a culture of compliance and we're going to audit for it. So that's how long it takes from something that we thought was a great document when it came out to get into kind of broader use and to get into the rest of the industries regulated by FinCEN. The, the two places we find the most interesting areas of compliance in terms of black holes are the, the fintech companies where people have just, as I said earlier, fabulously creative ideas on how to change the system, uh, but really do not understand, and I'd say Ripple Labs is an example of this, which was the first virtual currency case that FinCEN did. Uh, kind of a, what, these things apply to us? But because they do not live in the financial services world. I would say that one of the things we're seeing growing out of that is the increased use of virtual currencies to move money internationally in the money transmitter world because it cuts out the bank. Someone goes to a money transmitter, a legal registered money transmitter in, say, New York, and says, I want to send what's the normal amount of this 54, 55 billion we send out a year? What, $500, 200, 300 something? It's not that much and gives the, the money transmitter in New York dollars, it goes immediately to, to a virtual currency, goes to what the usual channel that New York City uses, I mean, there, there are channels between various cities in New York and cities in, in particularly Latin America and other places, goes right there where it's immediately turned into the local currency, no bank. Uh, KYC at both ends, so we're, we're seeing people try to say, how do we lessen the burden? And I would say the third area is not the FinTech people, it's trade-based money laundering. It's over and under invoicing, which is, according to global financial integrity, about 80, 80 to 85 percent of the illegal financial flows in the world are done by over-invoicing trade. And I don't know how to really get at that. It means the bankers have to understand every single industry that they bank on you know, for a letter of credit, right? If you look at a letter of credit, you've got to know, is it over-invoiced or under-invoiced or right? You have to know that industry 
really and, and well. How can you? And and so it's really hard for them, I think, to be able to monitor it. There are certain things that are, you know, that you can look at from the trend from the trade transactions and certain information. And if you work in a particular industry, you need then to become somewhat expert in the you know the amounts that should be charged, you know, for the different you know products. But it is a really difficult business for the banks to then have to become experts in every industry. Where we're doing that is we're working with the freight forwarders who tend yeah. to know the businesses right. better. Right, right. Logistics companies, the freight forwarders, yeah. right. Who are also have their own bribery and corruption issues, but yes. No. <laughs> right. So just going back to your example, Ed, so you, you this, this know your customer at both ends of the transaction, but because it's done in a virtual currency, don't you lose visibility in the middle part of that exchange? Well, I mean, you do, and, and you don't, it's, it's harder to follow the dollars uh -huh. because under the travel rule, travel rule requires that when a, an electronic funds transfer is sent, the originator, originator's account, originator's bank travels all the way through the transaction to the beneficiary bank where the beneficiary is, which was something, how many years did it take to put that into effect <laughs> to, ch to change all the electronic mm -hmm. systems? Mm -hmm. Took a decade, probably? Not done yet. It's, not it's just changing it. It's just, it's just finishing the funding. The requires requiring it. Right. Yeah. So Stephanie, you're, you're regulating virtual currency companies as, as money services business, I think. Do I, I get that right? Correct. Are, are you concerned, though, about the, just the inherent loss of visibility you mm -hmm. get with virtual currencies? No. Um, in March of 2013, we issued our guidance, obviously uh, clarifying that virtual currency exchangers and administrators are covered as money transmitters. Money and, you know, we think that our uh, regulations um, cover them in an appropriate way. Um, one of the things that we've done um, that somewhat goes to this point, but the broader issue is we've worked over the past um, year or so with our delegated examiner for non-bank financial institutions, including uh, money transmitters, to do a series of supervisory examinations involving IRS personnel, FinCEN personnel, of uh, virtual currency exchangers and administrators. And you know, obviously the purpose of that is compliance of that entity, but there's an education process that happens um, in exams, and we're hopeful that that will assist the entities that are being examined, but also spread throughout the industry. And I think to the point that I made about when we do think it's appropriate to take an enforcement action, we spend the time to explain the factual issues, the legal violations, our enforcement action involving Ripple Labs, which we took in conjunction with the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District of California. They had a criminal case. They have a great partnership with that office. Really goes through some of the issues that I think you know Ed has touched on um, broadly about the industry. It hasn't been linear for the you know virtual currency world, right? So they took a few steps forward, and then they had big yeah. issues that brought They're them back. The Bitcoin price. Exactly. Yeah. And so there's been there's been lots of issues that address it. So I think that. It, People thought originally it was going to take off and really be much bigger than it has become yet. It doesn't mean that after some footfalls it might not actually eventually get there. Sure. It's just t taking, I think, a little longer than people first anticipated. And DFS has come out with, you know, this, uh, with the regulation relating to that as well and, with, you know, being able to, um, they want to voluntarily be able to look at, you know, organizations and to, to be able to license them. So I think that there's a lot moving there. It's going a little more slowly than people thought originally, though. 